Chapter 15 Back in Surrey, the Martians had resumed their offensive. Three came out about eight o'clock and, advancing slowly and cautiously, made their way through Byfleet and Parford against the setting sun. They fired their heat rays at the battery of guns. The ammunition blew up, the pine trees all about the guns flashed into fire. Only one or two of the men escaped. It was a few minutes later that these three senators were joined by four other Martians, each carrying a thick black tube. The seven distributed themselves at equal distances along a curved line between St George's Hill, Weybridge and the village of Send. Four of these fighting machines crossed the river. Two of them, black against the western sky, came into sight of myself and the curate as we hurried wearily and painfully along the road that runs northwards out of Halliford. They seemed to us to move upon a cloud, a milky mist that covered the fields and rose to a third of their height. At this sight the curate cried faintly in his throat. He began running, but I knew it was no good running from a Martian. I turned aside and crawled through the dewy nettles and brambles into the broad ditch by the side of the road. He looked back, saw what I was doing, and turned to join me. The occasional howling of the Martians ceased. They took up their position in the huge crescent around their cylinders in absolute silence. Our guns were waiting. We crouched and peered through the hedge. After what seemed to us an interminable time came a sound like a distant concussion gun. Another nearer and then another. The Martian beside us raised his tube into the air and discharged it. The one towards Staines did the same. There was no flash or smoke. Clambering up into the hedge, I looked towards Sunbury. As I did so, a big missile hurtled overhead towards Hounslow. I expected at least to see smoke or fire, but all I saw was the deep blue sky above with one solitary star and the white mist spreading wide and low beneath. There had been no crash, no answering explosion. The silence was restored. What has happened? said the curate, standing up beside me. Heaven knows, said I. A bat flickered by and vanished. Distant shouting began and ceased. I looked again at the Martian. He was now moving eastward along the river bank with a swift rolling motion. Every moment I expected the fire from some hidden battery to spring upon him, but the evening calm was unbroken. The figure of the Martian grew smaller as he receded. Soon the mist and the gathering night had swallowed him up. Everything had suddenly become very still. Far away to the southeast, we heard the Martians hooting to one another. Then the air quivered again with the distant thud of their guns, but the earthly artillery made no reply. At the time we could not understand these things. Later I was to learn that each of the Martians had discharged a huge canister of gas. The smoke then poured upward and spread itself slowly over the surrounding country. The Martians then set about spreading strange stifling vapour across London as methodically as men might smoke out a wasp nest. By midnight the black smoke extended as far as the eye could reach. And through this, two Martians slowly waded and turned their hissing steam jets 
this way and that. Sunday night was the end of the organised opposition to their movements. After that, no body of men would stand against them. Even the crews of the torpedo boats and destroyers that came up the Thames refused to confront them. Before dawn, the black vapour was pouring through the streets of Richmond. 